Hello. Hello. Hi, I'm not actually Navid. I'm Layla. <laughs> Good morning. You look like Navid a little bit. Do I? <laughs> no. <laughs> Hold on, my audio is not working properly. Okay. Maybe let's give it a couple minutes to see if any other agents join. Can you hear me fine? Yeah. Okay, good. Can everyone else hear James? Yeah. Hi, Tish. <laughs> I'm on time, see? Hey, good job. <laughs> How's everyone doing this morning? Sounds good. <laughs> Let me sell those houses. <laughs> yeah. So what's the plan for today? Um I don't know, you tell me. <laughs> well, we just need some information about 31 exchanges. Um, is there any particular topics that people want to hear about specifically? I'll leave it to the agents for that. I guess not. <laughs> Yes, not. <laughs> like all the agents are, they're all cowards right now. I can't see anybody. Turn your cameras on. I might scare you away. <laughs> no. I doubt it. They're shy. <laughs> <laughs> Don't be shy, guys. I'll have it on in a minute. Okay. <laughs> Good. It's nice to see people instead of yeah. just names. Yeah. Okay. Okay, I think at 11.05 we can start. Okay. Um, are you going to be sharing your screen? No, no need. Okay. Well, if you need to, just let me know. I can make you help. Okay. Where is David? He is at home, I think. <laughs> so I'll be monitoring this today. And I'm not sure if Anila, our office manager, is joining or not, but we'll see. Well, at least that is a picture and not just a name. I know. <laughs> Yay, we have more people joining. But Grace hasn't moved since she got on the line. Yeah. Hi, Grace. <laughs> Hi, guys. Are you guys making fun of me? I just literally got onto the car, okay? 
Are we supposed to show our face? Yeah. And you want to? Yeah. Okay, fine. I'll show I think my we face. make him feel a little but more. But not everyone else is doing it. Yeah. yeah. No one. Well, I encourage everyone to turn their cameras on if they can, just so we can see your guys' lovely faces. Otherwise, oh, it could be I just a conference call. I just know I'm yeah. in the car. That's okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay. When I stop moving, I'll be honest. <laughs> Thanks, Hi, Tish. Hi, Miss Tish. Charles. <laughs> I'm good. Long time no see. I know. Like yesterday, no see. <laughs> 20, 20 hours. <laughs> Is that right? That's a long time for me. <laughs> I need my tish fix. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, I think we're ready whenever you are, James. All right, let's get started. We're going to talk about 1031 exchanges today. I'll hit any topic that you guys want. If we want to start from the beginning of 1031, the middle of 1031, the advanced 1031, marketing the 1031 anything uh right now is the opportunity to tell me what you want to hear about you guys so someone outside of grace say something well grace and Tisha, <laughs> both. it both went from the both. beginning of 10 31 yeah Excellent. so i mean what i really want to hear is like i have a client that has multiple properties looking to buy other properties Girlfriend. doing the exchange versus you know just doing a, a regular purchase and sale right and okay. the benefits of it if that makes sense all right so we'll talk with um the beginning of 1031 exchanges multiple properties in a 1031 exchange anyone else how about marketing uh, 1031 okay exchanges? we'll definitely yeah. talk about marketing to the 1031 exchange opportunity out there and how you guys can increase your business or perhaps create a niche of mm -hmm. uh the 1031 exchange and investment properties and going after that type of market. Okay. Anyone else? All right, then with that, we'll get started. So, you know, people always ask me what I do for a living and what a 1031 exchange is. And I like to keep things very, very simple. And if somebody asks you, or if you really want to give a simple definition, it's very basic when it comes to the 1031 exchange. It's the internal revenue code that impacts investment property, just real estate investment property, where when you are selling an asset, instead of taking the money and and I'll mute them. Okay, there you go. Okay. <laughs> So very simply, the 1031 exchange is when you sell and buy investment property. And if you follow certain guidelines that I will review today, you'll be in a position to pay absolutely zero in capital gains tax. So this is huge. I mean, there is no other wealth building tool out there where you can buy like a stock, make all kinds of money, and then sell it and not have to pay taxes. And that's exactly what can happen. And when we're talking about the state of California, you don't have better appreciation anywhere in the United States. You don't have more real estate activity anywhere in the United States. And this is the opportunity that you can capitalize on. Now, I know the office is located in Contra Costa County, but who are we talking to today? What counties? Alameda, Contra Costa. That's what I said, it is pretty much, yeah. Okay, so basically straight Bay Area. So it really mm -hmm. impacts you. So when we look at Alameda County, I'd say about 38% of the residential property in Alameda County qualifies for a 1031 exchange. When I see Contra Costa County, it's a little bit less, maybe about 36% of the residential property qualifies for a 1031 exchange. This is huge because if you're not going after it, if you're not trying to capitalize on that market, your competitor truly will. So we know what the exchange is, investment property for investment property. But I also get a question out there where people say, well, OK, I, I kind of understand what it is, but why do people do this? And the number one answer I hear is to not pay capital gains tax. That's why people do 1031 exchanges. And that answer is absolutely incorrect. If you don't want to pay capital gains tax, there is a very simple strategy. Do not sell the asset. If you do not sell, you are not going to pay capital gains tax. So why do people do 1031 exchanges? Well, I'll tell you, it's very simple. There are tons of reasons. Number one, I've been a landlord for about 20 years, and I can tell you right now, I am tired of the tenants, the trash, the toilets, the termites, 
all the terrible T's. I don't want to be a landlord anymore. I don't want to pay taxes. What is my option? Well, wouldn't it be cool if I could get out of being that landlord and get into something passive and preserve all my equity? So like, when you, we start looking at reasons, and I think this would happen in a listing appointment or just in a regular conversation, if somebody's complaining about the property, right? Oh my God, another thing went wrong with the property. I got to fix the roof. The pipes burst. There's a plumbing issue. There's an electrical issue. My tenants aren't paying on time. Whatever the reason may be, maybe it's an opportunity to unload that asset. You know, quite often right now, I'm hearing, I hate the state of California. I want to get out of the state of California. But if I sell my property here, I'm going to pay a lot of taxes. Well, the 1031 exchange will provide you the opportunity to sell that asset, go into anywhere in the United States, to sell that asset, to get out of active management into passive management. Or maybe like Tish was saying earlier, we've got the cat out there that owns about five different properties, doesn't want to own five properties and maybe wants to consolidate it into one property. Wouldn't it be cool if I could sell five resi properties and buy this one huge commercial property that's completely triple net leased and I don't have to worry about that asset any longer? You know, what's amazing is that I talked to so many people in the Bay Area. We're talking Contra and Alameda County. Um, I was on a, it was a CPA type of golf event at Round Hill Country Club in uh, Alamo. And the guy I was paired up with, well, he was a complete ass, but all he did the whole time was brag about how cool he was and how much money he had and the four acres of bare land that he had in Alamo. And after a few holes, and maybe a few drinks, I said, well, how much income are you getting on that bare land? He's all nothing, but it's worth millions. And I go, yeah, but you know what? If you could sell that property for the millions that you claim and reinvest it into an asset that produces income, wouldn't that be better? Wouldn't it be cool if you have an asset that's worth $3 million and you're getting a five or 6% cash on cash return and you go from making absolutely zero to 150 to $180,000 of income? This happens so often in the Bay Area where people have owned investment property for so many years with massive appreciation and they don't understand that what they think is a cash cow may in reality be very, a very poor piece of investment property. Great example is my parents. They bought investment property in San Francisco in the early 70s, and they bought it for under $60,000. Two different properties, one triplex, one single family home. Both properties are worth in the millions today. And my dad thinks that the triplex is just the most awesome property in the world. And I go, dude, we own investment property for four different reasons. Let me go over the reasons with you. Number one, cash flow. You're in a three unit building in San Francisco. You're subject to rent control. You're averaging about $2,000 per unit gross. And you can't raise the rent because market value rents five grand, you're getting two grand. This is not a good cash flow vehicle. Second, reason we own investment property is depreciation. Now for residential property, and this is a residential asset because it's three units and four units or less is residential, you can depreciate the asset, have that write-off for 27 and a half years. They've owned it for 50. There is no more write-off. And here's the way write-offs work. It's not off the appreciation, it's off the original purchase price. So there wasn't much depreciation, even if there was left that they could claim per year. So when we look at their cash flow, it sucks and they can't change it because of rent control. We look at their depreciation, it's runoff. So there is no write-offs. Third reason we own investment property is amortization. Well, they had a loan years ago, but it's free and clear. So they're not building up the equity in that asset by paying down the loan. And the fourth reason we own investment property is appreciation. Now they killed it on this one. But when you look at this asset and my dad goes, yeah, we're making six grand a month. I go, no, you're not. It ain't six grand a month. This property was built in 1908. You're always doing something to the property. That six grand is more like four grand after expenses. You're making $48,000 on an asset that's worth over $3 million. Wouldn't it be better if you weren't subject to rent control, if you didn't have to manage this property, if you've got a new depreciation schedule, if you tripled your income, because that's exactly what you could do. If you sold this asset, preserved all the equity through a 1031 exchange, no longer have to manage it. My dad's really old, by the way. He's like 
really old and he still manages it. And we have situations like this quite often where now instead of using his energy to go work on the property, he could use it on the golf course or whatever hobby that they may have. This is what 1031 exchanges are about. It's about making dreams come true. It's about changing lifestyles. I've worked with so many different people that thought they were sitting on a cash cow like my parents, where it actually is not a cash cow. It is something that is bleeding you. The physical labor you put into it, the tenant issues that you have to deal with, the rent control that they have to deal with, and the lack of write-offs, it makes no sense any longer. This is the opportunity to touch people like that and let them know, hey, there's something better out there. I can get you better cash flow and less headaches. That is what a 1031 exchange is about. Now, I gave a presentation yesterday in Modesto. Yeah, it was far. It was ugly. But I had to go out there. And uh, this one guy says, you know what, uh, that's a great song and dance you have, James, and you're a really good speaker, but I don't really care about any of that. All I want to do is just retire and go to an island. How are you going to make that happen? I go, look, I've got the answer for you. Like I told you earlier, I can make dreams come true. Here's what we're going to do. And this guy owned two properties, one investment and one primary residence. Guy was about 73 years old, married, empty nester, lives in a nice house in Alameda, and he... Um, and he has an investment property in Modesto. And he goes, um, make that happen. I go, here's what we're going to do. We're going to sell the investment property in Modesto. It's a, it's a really nice property for about $800,000. We're going to do the 1031 exchange. You said you wanted to go to an island. Last time I looked, Hawaii is an island. We're going to 1031 exchange into that Hawaii property. I'm going to pick Maui because that's my favorite island. I'm going to pick Kanapali because that's my favorite spot in, in Maui. And we are going to do the 1031 exchange to buy that property. And for the first year or two, we're going to treat it as investment property. Then we are going to move into that property. Then you are going to sell Alameda. You're a married couple, so you can protect 500,000 of your gain. And you have protected all of the capital gain consequence from the sale of Modesto. You have bought the dream home that you want to live in. You have sold your home and you have pocketed 500,000. And you know what he said? Great story, but my gain is 1.3 million on the primary residence. How do we solve that? I go, it's real easy. We'll sell the industrial property, do the 1031 exchange, buy the Hawaii property, rent it first, then move into it. Then instead of selling the Alameda property, we will rent it for one to two years. Then we will sell that asset. We still lived in a two out of the last five. So you collect the 500,000 in 1031 exchange, everything else. And he goes, but I don't want to manage properties. And I go, that's why the Delaware Statutory Trust, where you can buy a fractional interest in a large commercial institutional property, where they will arrest you if you try to work on the property and it will give you a five to 7% cash on cash return. You will be very happy with that supplemental income to support all of your habits that you have in Hawaii. End game is what we called it yesterday. So again, this is more on the marketing aspect to 1031 exchanges. We now know that in Contra and Alameda County, over 35% of the residential property out there qualifies for a 1031 exchange. We now know that people do 1031 exchanges to get better pieces of investment property. Yeah, you get the benefit of not paying capital gains tax. That is an obvious one. But why are people doing it? To buy the dream home get better cash flow, new depreciation schedule, relocate to a different state, buy different types of investment property, consolidate assets, asset, assets, not assets, assets into maybe a commercial property or maybe into less properties. Like Tish was talking about earlier, they, she has a client that has multiple properties and may want to reinvest into one. You can make that happen in a 1031 exchange. If you come to me and let me know exactly what the client wants to do, I will lead them to the path to make that happen. The beautiful thing for real estate professionals, not only do you get the list, but you get the replacement property. Yeah, if they go to Hawaii, who cares? Get a referral fee from the realtor that helps them there. Here's what I've learned from doing this for over 24 years. Investors hang with investors. If you create that niche, if you create that path, you will do one good thing for one that will lead to many, many, many more transactions. So when it comes to why do people do 1031 exchanges, I hope I've cleared that up. When it comes to what a 1031 exchange is, it's investment property to investment property. By the way, there are only three pieces of real property out there that do not qualify for a 1031 exchange and everything else does. Number one, the primary residence does not qualify for a 1031 exchange. I think we're all aware that if we've lived in a property two out of the last five years as a primary residence, if we are single, 250,000 of the gain is tax-free. If we are married, 
500,000 of the gain is tax free. Anything up and above is subject to capital gains tax. So in Alameda and Contra Costa County, that sometimes gets exceeded. That's why I already explained earlier in the example that you can move out of that property, rent it for one to two years, then sell it, and then take the 500 or 250 and exchange the rest. There are ways to protect all the equity, but the primary residence does not qualify. On the primary, since we're talking primary, let's be very careful on the primary residence because particularly in Alameda County, more than Contra Costa County, although Contra has a fair share as well, there are many mixed use properties. What do I mean by that? Well, if we just go to Oakland, you could find many duplexes where they live in one unit and rent the other unit out. Yeah, one is the primary, but one's also investment. So they qualify for both. Or how many of the realtors on the call today actually work out of their homes and claim it on their taxes. If that is the case, it's a mixed use property. It's not gonna be 50-50, it might be 80-20, 70-30 or what have you, but that is a mixed use property. If we go out to, well, if we're talking Contra, there aren't many left, but if we go to like Brentwood and the farms out there, the farmers live on the farms more often than not. The farm will qualify for the exchange and the primary residence, well, that will be the primary residence exclusion portion. So you can, make things happen. I mean, if we go to Brentwood, look at all the casitas out there. If we go to a lot of the properties, look at all the in-laws, mixed use properties. So on the primary, if it's solely primary, it does not qualify for a 1031 exchange. But if there is a mixed use component, you could take advantage of both section codes. Second piece of real property that doesn't qualify for a 1031 exchange is the second home. By the way, second home doesn't qualify for anything, right? The primary has the 25500 the investment property has the 1031 exchange. The, prime, the uh, second home has, do your patriotic duty, Pay your taxes. There is no way around that unless you convert the second home into investment property. And it's real simple. Here's the minimum requirements. This is how simple it is. Airbnb the property. All you have to do is rent it out 14 days out of the year and not use it for personal use more than 14 days of the year for two years. Then it is magically investment property. So the second home doesn't qualify for an exchange, but you can convert it to investment property depending upon how you treat it. And that can happen in a short period of time. Third piece of property that doesn't qualify for a 1031 exchange is the flipper. So you'll come across people that buy, fix, and look to sell. And they make a lot of money on it and they don't want to pay the taxes. That does not qualify for a 1031 exchange. You have to operate it as investment property. So here's what I tell the flippers. Buy it, fix it, rent it. Is mixed use property fourplex to rental qualify? Yeah, it could be a. I had a guy in Berkeley that sold a 16 unit building and he lived in one of the units. It was mixed use. That one 16th was protected and the others weren't. So it doesn't matter how many units, it matters if they are using a portion of it as the primary. Rental portion 1031, primary portion primary. And if they're using two units out of the four units as a primary, the two units are protected by the 250-500 and the other two units will qualify for a 1031 exchange. So back to the flipper. How do we make a flipper qualify as investment property, operate it as investment property? How do we operate it as investment property? Rent it, depreciate it. Do that, how long? That's the magic question. There is no answer, it's gray. So when it comes to something like that, I always get the tax advisor involved the aggressive CPA says rent it for a year and a day. That's the definition of a capital long-term investment. We're cool with that. The guy that's in the middle says cross two tax years. And then the conservative cat says, wait two full years because there's a revenue procedure that supports that. Other than that, every other piece of real estate qualifies for a 1031 exchange. So you're gonna find a lot of different opportunities that you may not know exist. You're gonna find a lot of people in your sphere of influence that may have a 1031 exchange opportunity. As a real estate professional, do not ever give tax and legal advice, but you go to classes like this to learn about opportunities where you can implement your team. I'm part of the squad right now. All you got to do is hit me up so I can talk to your clients and let them know if the 1031 exchange is a fit. I will also talk to them, let them know what their potential tax consequence is, but let them know if you want to get something exact, you're going to have to talk to your tax advisor. This is based on information that you've given me and I am just guessing, but it'll give them a very close idea of what they would pay because a lot of people, they go up like, dude, I'm just going to take the money. It's a lot of money and I'll pay the taxes because it's only 15%. I'm like, who told you that? They're like, no, it's 15%. I go, it ain't 15%. That's the least amount that you're probably going to have to pay the feds. But, you know, Joe wants to get paid. Gavin wants to get paid. 
Sam wants to get paid and Barack wants to get paid. They go, what do you mean by that? Well, you have federal tax. You're either going to get hit at 15 or 20 percent based on how much money you make on this property and how much money you make that year. Then you got state tax. Gavin's going to make you pay either 9.3, 10.3, 11.3, 12.3 or 13.3. The larger the gain, you're going to get very close to that 13.3 or exceed it. And they're like, well, what, what, what do you mean, Barack? I'm like, well, Obamacare came out in 2010. And part of Obamacare said that on investment property, on gains where a single person sells and they make more than 200,000 per year, and that includes the gains. So most people exceed this. They'll start having to pay 3.8% on every dollar above that amount. And for a married couple, people usually think, oh, it's 400. Can you 400? It's 250. So once you make 250,000, they'll tack on an additional 3.8%. And we're not done yet. All the depreciation that you've claimed, they recapture 25%. California gets you good. They are going to make you pay anywhere between 30 to 40% on every dollar of gain. So when somebody says they want to just cash out, yeah, I know uh, I can do something, but I'm just going to cash out. Make sure they consult their tax advisor so they can make the best choice possible because the last thing they want to do is get a hefty tax bill saying, oh, you never told me. They're going to think that California state withholding 3.33% takes care of their taxes. That doesn't take care of much, to be honest. So it's a hard reality check if they do not talk to their tax advisor when they truly find out exactly how much they're going to pay in capital gains tax. So let's go through an example. Anybody have any questions on any of that stuff? Tish, yeah, you got the floor. Yeah, so you mentioned, like, I know, I think over two, I think 200 or 250 for an individual person, right? That they're, on what part, uh, though? Obamacare or the primary residence exclusion? On the primary residence. So if there's, so my question is, if, if an individual attempts to sell a primary residence, how about, let me see, how do I make this question work really fast? Re, if they refi, if they refi and pull the money out, that's considered income. And then they have to wait 12 months before they can sell for the rest of the remainder of the equity if it's over 250? Or if well, it's, up. it's only on gains. So refining is not going to change anything. Your gain, like let's say I bought the property for 100000 and today it's worth a million and I'm single and I'm looking to sell this property and I can only protect 250000 of the gain. So that means that I am subject to like a huge hit of $650,000. I'm going to have to pay taxes on that part of the gain because I can only protect two fifty. dollars now, what you're saying is, well, what if I refied and took out like $600,000 and now I'm only left with a, a smaller amount of equity? doesn't matter. It doesn't change how much you're going to pay in taxes. Oh, the gains the will person. remain the same. Okay, got it. And a lot of people think that, oh, I only pay taxes on the equity or um, I can get my original down payment back or all these different misconceptions. Now is the time to ask me those questions. So you have clarity, not that you can give your client the answers. You don't want to do that, but you want to, when you hear things say, Hey, you know what? I'm not sure if that's quite correct. I want you to contact my colleague, James Callejas at IPX 1031 exchange. He's an expert who's been doing this for a quarter of a century. He can help you out. That is my job to make you look good so that you get the listing and the replacement property. And I facilitate the 1031 exchange only if needed. I talk more people out of 1031 exchanges. If they don't need it, I don't want it. Any other questions on any other thing that we've mentioned so uh, far? We had a question in the chat. Um, if you can oh yeah, I saw that, but it was, yeah. it was quick. Let's see, how long do owner own the property before they can exchange it? Does the property need to be held in investment to be eligible? So here are the answers on that. Yes, it must be investment property to be eligible. And how long? I think I kind of answered that with the flipper. You want to operate it as investment property, not just own it for at least one to two years based on how aggressive or conservative your tax advisor is. After that, sell it and do the 1031 exchange. And then the next question said, it's mixed use primary fourplex to rental qualifies. Yeah. Oh, do you wanna just turn your sound on so you can ask him? I'm not sure who's, um, who this is. Yeah, don't be shy. <laughs> <laughs> 
this has got to be the shyest group I've ever seen. People. We've got like five <laughs> people here. Nobody's oh, they are a shy group. <laughs> Hello? I'm, I'm telling Can David the moment we get off the call. Okay, Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. yes. I, I have a question. This is Mary Lou. Hi, Mary. Oh, hi, Mary Lou. <laughs> hey. Okay, I think I typed it because um, yeah. I have some issue with the voice control on this cell phone, okay? okay. But the question is a tax deferred. Uh, can you defer taxes if cap on capital gain? And if so, um, how long or do I have to invest or do they have to invest the whole amount of the purchase of the sale? Because if it's over 250, what are you? what is the best approach for that? Well, and remember- you, If the, you're not ready to buy it, I mean, okay. of the exchange, for, so, for the exchange. Remember, the 25500 is only for the primary residence that you've lived in two out of the last five years. The 1031 exchange is only for investment property. To pay zero in capital gains tax, you want to reinvest all of the proceeds that come from the sale and buy of equal or greater value to what you sell. So if you're selling something for a million dollars and there's a $500,000 loan on the property, the loan will be getting, the loan will get paid off at the close of escrow. The 500,000 will go into the 1031 exchange account. Your target price will be a million to pay no tax equal or greater to what you sell. How do you make up that other 500,000? Mm -hmm. You're either gonna get a new loan or you're gonna come in with cash to hit that number. Now, let's say like you found the perfect property for $900,000. You're like, I don't want a million dollar property. I just wanna buy something for nine. Can I do that? Mm -hmm. Yes, you can. When you buy down in value, when there is cash left over, that portion is going to be subject to capital gains tax. They call it boot, if you ever hear the word, and that's leftover cash or debt relief that was not replaced. So you can definitely do that. So if I bought the property originally for 300,000, I'm selling it for a million, I have a $700,000 gain. I put the $500,000 as a down payment. That's what I got after the loan was paid off. And then I come up with another loan of 400,000 buying of less value. Only the $100,000 is taxable, but all of the other gains fully deferred. And I will oh. keep that fully deferred until I sell and cash out. And if I never do that, this is the motto for 1031 exchange is you buy till you die. You swap <laughs> till you drop. And here's the reason why. When it comes to real estate, death is good because your basis is stepped up to current value, right? Bought it for 100,000, it's worth a million today. If I sell it, it's $900,000 gain. But if I die, that 100,000 goes to current market value. My beneficiary gets it, sells it, no gain. So that's why the buy till you die is great when it comes to estate planning. Otherwise, you're deferring until you sell to cash out. And a lot of investors, the true investor, never cashes out. They just keep on making money, getting more properties, getting that supplemental income, buying them vacation homes, those primary residences, following all of the steps, playing the game. And you could definitely do that in a 1031 exchange. Any other questions or I'll go straight to an example. Rich has two questions in the chat. Um, number one, what is a reverse 1031 and when do you want to use? I guess we can start with the first question. What is a reverse 1031 and when do you want to use it? Can you sell investment property and apply funds to another investment property mortgage via 1031 mm -hmm. exchange? I'm going to answer number one at the end because we'll do the forward exchange, then end with the reverse exchange. Very good question, by the way, Rich. People need to know about the reverse exchange. Um, second question is a very good question, but you're not going to like the oh. answer. You can only 1031 exchange into property that you do not already own. So putting it to pay down a mortgage on an existing property that you have does not qualify. You have to buy an interest in the property that you're looking to acquire, either 100% or a percentage interest as a tenant in common with whatever other owner is in that property. Um, but unfortunately, using those monies to pay down a mortgage on another property does not qualify. The buyer anyone else i have a question uh james um how do you get paid do you get paid based on like a percentage or like a fix uh yeah fee? we get 10 10 percent of the sales price all right I'm joking. no it's not 10 percent <laughs> of the sales price um actually our fees are kind of comical so i laid it out there really exaggerated our fee is based on the number of properties involved sylvia so if i'm selling one single family residence out here in san ramon um 
for $1.5 million and I'm buying a, a replacement property for $2 million as an example, the total fee would be $1,250. 1000 for the sale, $250 for each purchase. When I talk about reverse exchanges, I'll go over their fee schedule. It's a lot higher, but for a regular, regular traditional exchange, it's 1000 on the relinquished property and $250 for each property involved within the exchange. So if it's one-to-one -one purchase, 1000 plus 250. If you're buying two properties, 1000 250 250 1500 total or if it's like Tish's example and I'm selling multiple properties to buy one each additional property within the same exchange would be 250 as well and uh are those fees paid at close of escrow or up yes front? nothing's up front no uh, we take it after we receive the proceeds from the proceeds so it's a deductible closing cost right okay thank you all right anyone else or we're just going into an example here is the proof of the loan I'm making I can't the... hear you, Josephina. <laughs> so sorry. Or was I not supposed to hear that part? Do you, Josie, do you have a question? Uh, no, 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 it's fine. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, we hoped you had but I'm not sure. And she's not sure. <laughs> Neither was I, but now we know. So here's the example. Um, let, let's go with something easy. Um, let's go with my true life example. I bought my first piece of property in San Lorenzo, California, born and raised San Francisco, couldn't afford San Francisco back then. So bought in San Lorenzo, California, uh, for the Alameda County people on the call today, what do you think I paid for a three and one and a half, 1400 square foot home, 5,000 square foot lot in 1999? As Prince said, how much Tish? 100. Okay, this is San Lorenzo. This ain't Stockton. <laughs> you said 1999? 1999. Okay, 150. No. no. 270. A little bit less, but you're right in the right ballpark around oh, here. Oh, really? 200, wow. Yeah, come on now. $250,000 back in 1999. 1999. Yes, Prince and the Revolution are famous for that year. So, Sorry, what was the question? I missed it. San Lorenzo. San Lorenzo, Purchase. California, Alameda County, between San Leandro and Hayward and Castro Valley. I didn't even three, know that. Three, one? Um, three, one, one and a half, 1,400 square foot house, 5,000 square foot lot. The property was bought for $257,000 oh, in 1999. Today, that same property is close to a million dollars, which is crazy yeah. when there's staple restaurant. It's Black Angus and it's so <laughs> tiny and crazy out there. Um, <clears throat> but bought that property many, many years ago, did not stay there that long, moved out to Walnut Creek <clears throat> and became a rental and list the property for sale and get into contract and open up escrow. So this is how a 1031 exchange works, right? You buy the property for whatever the reason is. It might've been an investment property initially, could have been a primary, but I converted it to an investment property about 15, no, about 17 years ago. And it's been a rental ever since. So it's an investment property. I put it on the market for sale. I accept an offer. I open what happened? Uh oh. Oh man. You, you he owes what? Um. I don't know if he can. Did he freeze? Us. James, you're frozen. Oh man. Oh no. I wanted to know how much well, he owes. Good. I know. Oh. He's frozen. James, how much did you owe? Yeah, you froze for for a minute. Can you hear me? Okay. There it is. I can hear you. Can you all hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay. What part did I freeze on? You owe. <laughs> yes. And that's it. How much you owe? You said I owe, and then you blanked out. You went to, to, to Walnut Creek, and you were telling us about the rental property in San Leandro, San Lorenzo. And right. crap. I um, wanted to I, hear it that. Wasn't, it wasn't I owe. It's I'm old, because I don't even oh. remember what I said. So... Um, <laughs> It became a rental, so it qualifies for a 1031 exchange. My advice, um, and this is just being real to you guys, is that anytime you think a property qualifies for a 1031 exchange, give me a call. 
it could be a five minute conversation with the seller. I just want to make sure there's going to be no issues with that asset. And I'm going to always ask who owns the property. How is the property being treated? Because sometimes people say, I own it and they own it with others, or it's in some sort of a trust, or it's in some sort of an LLC or a corporation. What you need to know on 1031 exchanges is whoever sells it needs to buy it, uh, whoever that taxpayer is. And, and sometimes it seems so simple, but then I find out, oh, um, you bought this when you were single, you got married, you never put your spouse on title, and now you want to buy with your spouse. And when you buy with your spouse, you're selling as one, buying as two, you're buying half in your 1031 exchange, and you got a target price. So let's see if we could deal with this in, in advance. I have a call tomorrow scheduled with some people that want to sell or finance half of the purchase price. And I'm like, dude, if you sell or finance half the purchase price, then that means that money is going to come later and not going to go through the exchange. And when you get it later, it'll be taxable. So that's what I ask a couple of questions from the get so that when the property is on the market, I know there won't be a 1031 issue. And then we just go through the routine. And here's the routine. You had the call with James. Everything's cool. We're ready to list the property for sale. We put it on the market. We accept an offer. We open up escrow. Next call goes to James to open up the 1031 exchange account. I can't open it up earlier because I need a copy of the sales contract because we assign into the right. See, the seller can't be the seller at the close. If the seller is a seller at the close, the seller touches money. If the seller touches money, it's taxable. They can't touch money. So we assign into the rights through our legal documents to act as the seller for the seller. We'll create a 1031 exchange account in the name of the taxpayer that's selling the asset. So we'll get the contract so we can assign it to the rights of the contract. We'll get the title report from escrow so we'll know who owns the property. And I got to tell you, sometimes the title report and the contract don't match. Sometimes the title report and the person I'm talking to doesn't match. So that's why we like to get all of these things in advance to make sure that everything looks crystal clear, clear and everything looks cool with the 1031 exchange. So let's just say everything is good. And let's just say we're selling the property for a million dollars and there's a $800,000 gain on the property and there's a $300,000 loan. The 1031 exchange paperwork has been in place prior to the close of escrow and signed. Close of escrow occurs, $300,000 loan gets paid off, $700,000 goes into the 1031 exchange account. And now the clock starts ticking. You only have 45 days. That's a month and a half to let the exchange company know what you are going to purchase. You have to let us know in writing exactly what you are going to acquire. And that list cannot change after day 45. Now I've had many people over my career just email in the MLS or like give me a ridiculous number of properties. You can't do that. You are limited to what you can identify in a 1031 exchange. You have to identify using one of the three rules. First rule, it's called the three property rule. Using the three property rule, you can identify up to three properties of any value. This is the most common rule. This is where people are usually identifying you know, three properties looking to buy one. It's a big property. There's no limit in terms of the value and they're looking to buy that one replacement property. This is a very common rule. But then what about that cat that's selling the property for a million dollars and says, you know what? I just talked to this investor and he said that he bought condos in Buffalo, New York for $30,000 a pop and they're renting out for about five to $600 a month and the HOAs are $50 a month, straight cash flow. And I wanna buy a bunch of them. And if I buy three of them and my target price is a million, three of them only gets to 90,000. I need to buy a lot. So how am I gonna do it using that rule? I say, you're not gonna use that rule. You're gonna use the second rule. It's called the 200% rule. This is the rule that people use when they wanna buy a bunch of smaller properties. Here's the way it works. You're selling for a million. 200% of a million is 2 million. This rule says you can identify up to $2 million worth of real estate. So when I'm looking at condos at $30,000 a pop, how many could I buy if I have a $2 million limit? And the answer is a lot. How many do I need to buy to get to a million dollars? Same answer, a lot. And you know, it really depends on the investor, what they want to do. If they're looking to diversify and buy a lot of properties, it's probably the 200% rule. If they're looking to buy that big bad boy or maybe two properties, it's probably the three property rule. And if they're a gambler, they're going to love the third rule. The third rule says you can identify as many as you want, but you need to close on 95% of the value that you identified. And if you don't, the entire exchange fails. 
Do not ever use the 95% exception rule without my consultation. Most of these will fail because they are very difficult to achieve. It actually does not happen that often. So if you think it's something that you should entertain, please give me a call so I can walk them through it. So that's it when it comes to identification. Are there any extensions on the 45 day identification period? Not really. The only time you can get an extension is when the IRS gives you one. How cool is the IRS? They ain't cool. They want you to pay taxes. This is real. They want you to pay taxes. So the only way you're gonna get an extension is if the IRS issues one, they issue probably about 15 a year. And it's always because of some big disaster. We don't get that many in Northern California, to be honest. Now the fires, there were some extensions. COVID had an extension. They'll never have another one for COVID. They already told us that. And it's just a natural disaster that may get you an extension. Otherwise, just when your client asks you, is there an extension on the 45 day identification period? Just say, no, there isn't. Uh, and if, if magically there becomes one, I will let them know. So 45 days to identify. From day 45, you have an additional 135 days to close on what you identify. Use all the money, buy of equal or greater value, you pay no tax. It's as simple as that. Now, you do have to buy like-kind property. You're going to hear this quite often out there. And here's what I hear. People go, okay, I sold a single family home. I'm doing a 1031 exchange. I need to buy another single family home, right? I'm all, no. You can buy anything you want for the most part. Here's how it works. As long as you buy real property in the United States used for a business or investment purpose, it qualifies. So you could sell a single family home and buy bare land, farmland, vineyard land, condo rental, townhouse rental, single family home rental, duplex, triplex, four unit, 10 unit, 3,000 unit building, office building, warehouse, Retail shopping mall, get this, you could buy windmills, billboards, mooring, cemetery plots, syndications. You tell me what your client wants to buy, I will let them know how to make that happen. Any questions on anything that I have mentioned so far in terms of 45, 180, identification rules, like-kind property? Okay, hi, I have a question. Ah, somebody uh, different. <laughs> the, uh, my client actually, uh, she sold her, I mean, her rental property. Uh, after that, uh, she identified within 45 days. Okay. And then uh, that doesn't work it out. So we have to change it. Uh, we have to find another one. So in that case, how does it work? What day were you on when you found out that it didn't work out and you had to find another one? Uh, yeah, that was in the middle of uh, like, I think in... I think within 30 days, whatever. Okay, then you revoke what you identify because those properties don't work and you put the new properties in and you could do that as often as you could annoy me every day if you really wanted to. Please don't do that. But you really could. <laughs> but come day 45, Acela, is it Acela or a Yes, yes. Acela, come day 45, whatever your list says, you can't change it after day 45. But up to day 45, if you really wanted to, you could just keep on changing it every day. There's no true uh, reason to do that okay. unless you really like being that person. Um, that, that's happened before. But just keep in mind that come day 45, whatever you have on the list, that's it. Can't change it. And keep in mind also that we are required by law to keep the money in the exchange account until you mm -hmm. close on what you identify or day 181. And sometimes okay. people are like, oh, yeah, nothing worked out. It's day 60. Give me my money back. Can't do it. Got to wait another 121 days. Do you know how much I loathe that conversation? It ain't pretty. So I tell people up front, we actually had to put additional forms within our documents when I can get my money back. And we put it in like a 30 font and we bolded it because there were so many problems with that. So what I'm trying to say is don't just identify to identify, because if you're doing that, the money could be stuck there until day 181. And nobody wants that to happen. Okay. All right. Thank you. You're welcome. Any other questions on the identification process, like kind property or the timeframes? Would need to be in the morning. Didn't sound like a question, but Rich, did you want to repeat that? No, did not want to repeat that. Sorry. <laughs> Should be on mute. That's okay. Um, <clears throat> don't worry about it. Uh, I just bring this up because, you know, whether it's a commercial broker an attorney or a residential realtor, 
Um, the time frames and like kind property are um, are issues that come up quite often. I want to make sure everybody is comfortable with that. And if you're not, just remember to always give me a call. Now, uh, Rich, this is directed to you. We've gone through a forward exchange, so I think we want to bring the reverse exchange into this presentation because number one, the reverse exchange, I've never seen more reverse exchanges in my career. It is very popular. And in a market that we just witnessed where there was limited inventory available for a particular product, people said, look, James, I want to do a 1031 exchange, but if I do the exchange and I try to identify things, I'm getting outbid by everybody. It's not working. I don't know what to do. Um, I'm just going to have to pay taxes because I can't get the property I want, or I'm going to settle for something that I don't want. What can I do? And I say, well, there is the reverse exchange. And the reverse exchange is pretty cool because it allows you to buy the replacement property first and then sell the relinquished property. And in a seller's market, that'd be the ideal way to go, right? We know we could sell our property, but finding the property that we want within those time frames that's the true challenge. Now, when people hear that, they're like, yeah, yeah, let's do that. The reverse is what I want to do. And I go, well, let's see if the reverse is something that you can do because you have not sold that asset yet. How are you going to pay for the replacement property? Some people will answer that question with, I got cash. I could buy a cash. That is perfect. Okay, Asela, thank you. Um, that is perfect. But if you don't have the cash, then you're going to have to get financing. So here's how the reverse exchange works. You go into contract to buy the property first. You're buying first, selling second. You open up escrow, then we get involved as the exchange company. We put all of our 1031 exchange paperwork in place. Got to be in place. Oh, you froze again. Yeah. Close the clock starts ticking. You have 45 days to let me know what you're selling and 180 days to close it. When people hear this, they're just like, have the cash to buy it or they only have a portion of the cash they say okay i'm gonna i can do it but i need to finance it and then i let them know well you're buying residential property the llc is going to go on title is your residential conventional lender okay with that and i'd say about 98 percent of the time conventional lenders will not lend to the llc and they have to go private private money usually charges two to three points a reverse exchange can be very, very expensive. For the person that can buy it all cash, easy peasy. For the person that's going to get a loan, more expensive, more challenging. And for the person that doesn't have the money to make this happen, it is not an option. So I think the reverse exchange is for the right client, but it can work out nicely for the right client as well, because it provides them the opportunity to not worry about the 45 day identification, secure the property that they want. And in the right market, you could sell any property if you price it right in a short period of time. And you have 180 days, that's six months to get it done. So the reverse exchange, uh, we talked about Fees for a forward exchange of a thousand for the sale, two fifty for the purchase. A reverse exchange, residential property, all cash purchase is seven thousand dollars. If there's financing involved, seventy five hundred. If it's commercial property, then I've got to ask a series more questions to see. anything I don't know what happened did I lose you guys oh I think he's rejoining oh man <laughs> all righty then <laughs> But this is on uh, recording, isn't it? Yes, I'm recording it. So I'll be uploading it to um, our Facebook page and also YouTube. Okay. But I think um, there's probably... There you go. Was that me or you guys? Um, I don't know. I think you were frozen on your end. But... Did... What... 
part did it freeze at? Did I go through the entire reverse exchange and fee schedule? Partially. Um, it just cut out for like a, like 30 seconds or something, I think. So I think I left it off. Um, the fee schedule for reverse exchange for residential property is $7,000 um, and all cash purchase $7,500. Uh, if there is a loan, if it's commercial property, we'll need to have another conversation. But again, the point of the reverse is being able to secure the replacement property in advance and then sell the relinquished property uh, within 180 days. And if the if the client has the money to make this happen, it's a great strategy. Um, Rich, did you have any follow up questions? I know you're the one that brought up the reverse exchange on that. Um, or did you get enough? I don't know exactly when I froze on that. Nope, that was exactly what I was looking for. I, I had, honestly, I've been in the business like 20 years. And I had heard of reverse exchanges once or twice. Someone just asked me like a week ago. If they have the cash to buy it, Rich, it's pretty easy. If they, yeah. in, in this current market, I don't recommend it um, unless um, there's no inventory for what they're looking to buy. Okay, great. Um, the last thing I wanted to mention, then I'll take any questions. We're almost up at the hour anyway. Um, the question I get quite often is, all right, James, I found the perfect property. I sold for a million. I found the property at $850,000. I'm short, like $150,000. Can I make up that $150,000 with doing improvements on the house? I want to add an ADU and it needs a new roof. Can I do that? And the answer is yes, but it's a little bit challenging. Only real property qualifies as replacement property, like I mentioned earlier, not improvements. The way around it is similar to a reverse exchange. We as the exchange company will set up an LLC that will go on title at the close. And from us going on title at the close, you will have the entire 180 day period to get the improvements done. So you would identify what you're going to improve within the 45 day window and get it done by 180. The fees are similar to a reverse exchange. So unless you're gonna do like, I don't know, uh, $40,000 worth of improvements, it's not worth it. And with that, we are at the hour, I think, or close to. Does anyone have any questions? Um, I have a question. I don't know if you covered it, but you can do 1031 exchange with new construction, right? You can. And I think that's a great point to bring up. And a lot of people were doing this when there was um, no inventory and they're like, look, I'm going to get stuck. I don't want to pay the taxes, but how about that new development they're building over there? Could I get into contract right now for that property and then list my property when I know it's going to be completed within the 180 day period? And I go, absolutely. Put the deposit down out of your own pocket, secure the property. Then when you don't believe contractors either, because they're going to say it's going to be done in like 130 days. And that really means like 200 days. So list the property when you know that the property will be completed within the 180 day time frame. And I think it's a great strategy to get that very brand new property for your 1031 exchange. Okay, but it has to be completed within the 180 days. Yeah, it has to. You can't, um, well, you're not gonna wanna close and give all the money to a property that's not even completed. Right. Um, but some people try to do that. Gotcha. But you wanna have it done by day 180, absolutely. Anyone else have any questions? The last thing I wanna offer up is I mentioned to everyone that I have marketing materials. I think I did, maybe I did, and that was yesterday. I have marketing materials. So if anybody is interested in some of the stuff that I mentioned going after the non-owner occupied properties, work with your title rep to get that list. You wanna go after people that have owned it either for a long time or bought at the right time. So they have massive appreciation, give them the right message. Some of the things that I mentioned earlier, if you want, email me for those marketing materials, uh, their postcards, their letters, whatever. I don't care. Do what you want with them. Um, I'd love to help you if they look to eventually sell the property. Or if anybody wants a PDF on anything that I mentioned today, whether it's the second homes, whether it's converting into a primary residence, whether it's just a basic brochure or a brochure on the reverse exchange, any of that stuff, I have a PDF on pretty much everything out there. And, um, and with that, I, th I think we're good. Um, if you guys want to be included in my uh, monthly email distribution, um, just shoot me an email. And I don't know how we, we get everybody email in, email. in the chat for everyone. Um, and then also for the marketing materials, if you could email that to me, that'd be great. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, James. Thank you, Leila. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And there we go. 
everyone has emails in the chat if anyone wants it. Um, or you can ask me too, I have his information. Yes, that's it. Thank you, James. Okay, you guys have a great day. Look forward to working with all of you and next time maybe in person. Yes, for sure. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, bye-bye everyone. Bye. -bye, everyone. bye. bye.